Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to What's Left. Very exciting show coming up. But, as I say, this is What's Left. When I said, hey, hey, what's wrong, I want to turn you back tonight just to see you smile. You know I'm going to be there one, two, three. Welcome to What's Left, everyone. I'm James Martin, and I'd like to bring on my fellow uh, co-hosts, which I will do just now. Uh, Hello. Sean Holsell. Hi, welcome. I'm Renee Barnett. Welcome to What's Left. Uh, How's everyone doing? Great. Great. Yeah, good. Good I'm over here on the west coast of California, of the United States, and it's... uh, kind of a, a lot earlier than it is where you guys are sitting. Yeah, uh, well, I'm having to uh, do my usual, which is uh, drink lots of uh, coffee uh, to sort right. of stay, stay, <laughs> stay awake. But you know what, Renee, uh, we kind of drink coffee all day, so. That's yeah, nothing, special, nothing so. new, nothing new. <laughs> we're going to have to get our own coffee brand, you know, because uh, we're so known for always having the, the ever- yeah, just, just as a heads up to our listeners, we've already sold out of our coffee brand because me and Renee have drank it. We drank it all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? Speaking of sold out, uh, don't we have some merch now? Yeah, we have got merch. Um, and if you want to find our merch, there'll be a banner coming across the screen uh, shortly. Um, but we're on Red Bubble. So if you could do Red Bubble. And then do a search for What's Left Radio. You'll be able to see we've got uh, T-shirts, uh, cups, uh, prints, and, and all the rest of it. And we'll be adding more stuff. So we'll show you perhaps in uh, later shows some of the stuff that you can uh, uh, that you can purchase. And it goes to helping us keep on doing the show. Uh, we're on Patreon as well. Um, so if you want to uh, donate uh, a pound, a dollar, uh, whatever... Um, then it's patreon.com forward slash what's left. Uh, buy us that cup of coffee, perhaps. I, think, uh, I keep on hearing that on uh, other YouTube, but seriously, we really need coffee and uh, we don't want to put up <laughs> adverts uh, with sad looking faces uh, of us. You know, Renee and James haven't had a coffee for more, for please. <laughs> May I have some more? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we appreciate that. We appreciate all your support. Uh, and certainly, uh, not only that, but your ideas. Uh, so we, we want to cover what you want to hear about. We, we feel like there's sort of a dearth in coverage uh, from our side of the fence uh, out there on the airwaves. I, I heard someone uh, just talking about it last night on one of the major shows about how you, you go on and every single podcast is like far right. And they were opining that because, uh, you know, they know they can get people worked up. And when people get angry and worked up, you know, they they take action and they do things. So, and they're, you know, it's just, we're trying to uh, counter that a little bit by giving an alternative view and also your views. So we'd like to hear all about them. And uh, any suggestions you have for a show or a guest, we'd love to hear. And yeah. you can get in touch with us. You'll see our uh, socials coming up on screen in just a second. You know, do get in touch with us. Um, I just wanted to say sorry, Sean, for for butting in then. But a special, um, we uh, now know where everyone is listening from. So a special shout out to our listeners in Canada, Sweden, uh, the UK, and the United States as well. So uh, if you're listening uh, to us there, uh, hello. Uh, Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. We love you. All right. What do we got? Well, Sean, you wanted to uh, to come in? I I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, people people buy into the far right stuff. It's very simplistic sort of ideas and stuff not really found in reality and and playing to people's base instincts where it's it's often much, much more difficult to think rationally about things and see see the actual answers to, to problems in society. 
Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that 100%. It's, it's, it's an odd state of affairs where, you know, people seem to want to be riled up all the time and um, it's, it's difficult, but you know, that's why we're here. That's why we decided to do this show. Absolutely. We avoid Um, the darkness. People are right to be riled up. It's just not at the things they're currently riled up at. I think there's there's plenty of us that we need to be angry about. Absolutely. It's just directing that anger in the right direction. That's right. That's so true. I'm glad you pointed that out, uh, Sean, because uh, we should be angry about a lot of things, but not made up things. And we certainly shouldn't be turning on our neighbors, you know, and that's what's literally going on here you know, is people actually being threatened by their own neighbors just because they belong to, in their opinions, the wrong political party. It really is crazy and scary. It really, really is. Well, speaking of people being riled up uh, and... And not, crazy and scary? And, and scary, I suppose, <laughs> yes. Um, and a bit of stabby time, as I uh, prefer to, uh, to say. Oh. Um <laughs> We are going to be looking at uh, this evening uh, or this morning or afternoon, wherever you are, uh, into a period that has some very similar um, uh, instances that we would perhaps recognise today, um, certainly looking at things like the cost of living crisis. But we're going to be having a quick look into the past and see what we can learn from that period today and we've got a great uh, guest um, uh, joining us from uh, Lancashire in northwestern England and uh, oh, are we... no, no. <laughs> well if it was the northwest of the United Kingdom it would be like Nahalin and Yar uh, the Western Isles but uh, I just want to uh, introduce you um, to George White. Uh, George White is a British trade unionist with an interest in the history of social struggles. George became interested in history at school. His passion for the topic uh, was kindled by uh, attending trade union training courses and further enhanced by conversations with older activists within the trade union and labour movement. He uh, discovering uh, from those conversations the lesser told history of the working class and the struggles and fights that one is our right. Uh, George, hello. Thank you for, hello. for joining us on What's Left. Uh, how's everything going? Hello. Thanks Thanks for having me. Yeah, not so bad. Not so bad. Is everybody okay? Yeah. How are you? Not so bad. Not so bad. Fantastic, George. Yeah, it's good to see you. So, uh, George, we've got a hell of a lot to uh, talk about um, in, in terms of, uh, well, the English Civil War and I know that uh, we wanted to get into the uh, a group uh, called the Levellers uh, and then the Putney debates and things like food prices, the link with uh, revolutions, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, George, I suppose my first question um, will be, you know, for someone who hasn't heard about the English Civil War, maybe they have but don't know too much about it. I mean, how would you explain really to someone like that, uh, you know, what was the English Civil War really about um so yeah before before the english civil war i suppose you're into um sort of the divine right of kings absolutist monarchy uh, at the time i think a tendency towards more absolutist monarchy and after the civil war is where you would largely start to recognize sort of parliamentary um constitutional monarchy uh elements of democracy and the struggle in between now what the, the bit that the bits I know that we've talked about James is the is the sort of um, the bits of what could have happened the uh, the bits the bits in between you know the, the the agitators the levelers the diggers the ideas that were um, probably that were probably there underneath the surface but the civil war the the, the changes and the uh, the pressures at the time sort of brought them all to the forefront. And, you know, especially things like the, the Putney debates, there could have been an entirely different um, historical trajectory than the one that's that, that's led to where we are. So what were, what were the conditions that led, uh, essentially, uh, 
uh, people, uh, and this was a, a civil war that affected, um, you know, not just England, uh, of course, Scotland, and then uh, tragically um, in Ireland. What, what were the circumstances that led to that civil conflict? What, what, what really was it all about? Um, well, there was uh, sort of on the surface of it, there was th there were things like ship money, um, which was a way that the a way that the king was was able to uh, raise money without calling a parliament. The, the, there'd been several gaps in parliament uh, sitting because the king hadn't called them. I, I think we, we have it in our minds that the um, you know that the that the parliament in in Britain or in the, in the United States the, the the Congress would be permanently sitting. It wasn't the thing. It was. Um, something that the king had the right to call or dismiss and only really needed to call them if, um, if he wanted to levy taxes on, you know, especially in times of war, things that cost a lot of money to, to raise. So the king was abusing some of the existing powers like ship money. Uh, ship money, um, I, think, I think it goes back maybe even to Anglo-Saxon sort of times. And it was the... Uh, the ability to, uh, to to levy this money to keep a, a standing fleet to ward Vikings off, I think. Um, it was something that all the counties that had a coastline had to contribute to, uh, but the king was was, say, was levying ship money in every in every county, and this was one of the um, rights that Parliament was demanding had to be addressed at the time. So, in, in in other words, you you've got a parliament that uh, sits when the king, who you know, an, an absolute monarch, you know, controlling uh, the country. Whenever the king uh, wanted money for a war or whatever it was, would then call a parliament. And uh, for people who were um, living in this period, this is you know, they are uh, presumably. Uh, living very much hand to mouth. They, they, these are not people who can really afford these extra taxes. Um, you know, when it's a battle for uh, survival. Um, uh, so, what what really uh, you know what was the, the the spark then? So we've got this tax. Uh, what was the uh, the spark that caused people to have such rifts in society? We, I mean, we see this today. Uh, you know, we, uh, the civil war sort of split into. To two camps. I mean, could you could you talk to us a little bit about that? So, well, I think I think the the pressures that were building. You sort of at the cusp of the end of feudalism, the beginning of something that we would recognise, um, and you know the the ideas that certain things like um, you've got uh, the rights to pasture, which is the right for uh, small holding farmstead type. Um, very small um, peasant farming type uh, ventures, the rights for them to feed their animals on common land. Or you've got things like um, estovers, which is uh, the right to gather fallen wood in the Lord of the Manor's forest, i.e. heat yourself, cook your food with it. Um, the right to panage, which is um, not really a thing where, where I come from, but especially somewhere like the New Forest where... You get to drive your pigs through the new forest and they can eat all the acorns and fatten your pigs up. But those sorts of rights, which you can imagine if you're at the very fringes of being able to feed yourself and those rights suddenly disappear, um, you're into starvation, you're into being dispossessed from your meagre amount of property that you already had. And so at that time, there was a lot of, um, and it accelerated afterwards to be fair, but there was a lot of uh, what's called the enclosures, which is, um, you know, you go you go to the authorities, you go to Parliament, and you say, uh, "Well, I'm the Lord of the Manor, so can I enclose all this land that I currently, you know, let people graze their animals on?" And we'll say that's my land, and that was the the subtext of what was happening at the time. Oh, oh, so, some other things as well, things like the draining of the Fenland, which again wasn't exactly common land in the in those sorts of terms, but it was marginal land that people could hunt and fish and gather and whatnot on. 
So just to, just to explain for uh, for our listeners, if you were to look at a map of um, the British Isles, they most certainly in this period, so we're talking about the middle of the 1600s, would not look like the map that we see today. Uh, well, uh, I wouldn't suggest it's necessarily a good thing, but uh, most of Norfolk, for example, um, was under water. Um, you have the uh, the fens. You also uh, see other places that um, the land was reclaimed essentially from the sea in low uh, lying areas. So we've got a really good um, sort of base to to go from now. I mean, this starvation. I mean, uh, how did then um, you know you know that want from uh, from people? How did that translate to? Uh, parliament. I mean, uh, are, are the people in Parliament um, you know, elected um, by the people, or are they um, are they appointed? I mean, could you talk to us a little bit more about uh, about that? Um, you know, what did Parliament actually look like, and you know, who were they? Well, I think um, I think probably you could you could argue that they were elected, but the electorate at the time was based on property, so. Uh, you were elected probably by maybe two or three percent of the population of your constituency at the time. It was quite small, and then this is this is before the um, uh, the rotten boroughs have gotten rid of. So you've got you know also places that are um, you know under the sea that still have a member of parliament or places that have. Three men and a and a sheepdog living there that are that have a member of parliament. So it's not exactly uh, again something representative like we would imagine uh, a parliament ought to be. Do you think? I mean, I know they're sort of skipping ahead. Do you think that's one of the reasons why we see today this sort of uh, you know uh, voter ID, uh, you know, the limits and uh, uh, obstacles uh, for people trying to, to vote. Do you think there's a sort of demand uh, from this this elite to try and get their rotten boroughs back? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'd also say the, the sort of um, the resistance to expanding the franchise as well, which I suppose there's always been a resistance to expanding the franchise to people who didn't just own property or to working people and to women and you know lowering the age and the, the, there's still a huge resistance to um, lowering the age to you know i think there's this calls for it to be lowered to 16 and uh, there's huge resistance to that uh, one of the big arguments being that oh people wouldn't wouldn't be uh, grown up enough to um, to vote the right way well i, I know people who are 65 who aren't old enough to, old enough and grown up enough to vote <laughs> <they're making. laughs> <laughs> that's a really good point George and I think as well we're denying the votes with the people the most skin in the game with the most sort of sort of responsibilities coming up and, and access to housing and good quality work and employment who are being denied any say in what in what society is going to look like for them I think it's yeah it's a very good point well they're old enough to pay tax aren't they you know well, that's it. And, you know, in uh, the mantra, I'm sure we'll get to this, uh, you know, with the US revolution was this sort of idea, well, the, the US revolution was based upon food prices, but, you know, no taxation without representation mm -hmm. uh, was one of the key things. So you have a, a group of people, you know, 16 year olds who can start work and pay tax, who have no representation uh, within the uh, the parliaments uh, of the day, so um, we've got all these frustrations. We just jump back to the sort of civil war period. We've got all these frustrations, you know, the uh, starvation, lack of representation, and what has been remarkable. I mean, we were discussing this before um, we sort of came on air about these these groups that sort of develop. But just before we get to that, um, you know, we've got this absolute monarch. We've got parliament. Um, there are two sides uh, to the civil war, families are split and all the rest of it. What do you think brought, I mean, do you think the end of the civil war is a people's civil war? Um, or do you think it's essentially, well, uh, two cheeks of the same arsehole, essentially battling the parliamentarians and the 
um, and the monarch. Yeah, well, I think I think that probably the the rights that Parliament was trying to assert were neither here nor there to most ordinary people in in, in England at the time. I think well. I would probably think that a lot of people didn't really decide which side of the civil war that they were going to enlist on. I think it was largely this part of England's royalist, I mean, the royalist army, this part of England is, uh, you know, it's, it's with Parliament. I'll, I'm, that's the, the side that I've been recruited to there. But later on, um, you know, the the um, the parliamentarian army after certain reform was at the beginning of the English Civil War, was very lacklustre. It was losing the Civil War, basically. And after certain reforms, um, it, the, the the character of the um, the English um, Roundhead Army managed to um, foster something that led to a lot of um, debate, a lot of democratic tendency, um, things that I think have probably persisted, even though the uh, the democratic army idea uh, probably went by the wayside. Um, why were they called roundheads um, and cavaliers? What, do you know the origin of that? Well, the ca a cavalier is to do with the like chevalier, isn't it? It's the knights. It's the uh, the, the caval, the horsemen. But the uh, the roundheads again. The roundhead army had plenty of cavalry themselves, but it was to do with the the armor style and the short cropped hair and all the the basically utilitarian everything in the you could argue everything in the cavalier side was all about show and um, fashion and everything in the reformed army was about utilitarian, you know. Even down to the colour of the tunics was down to that's the cheapest colour dye that's on the market, sort of thing. Mm. It's really, really interesting. Um, so the, the Civil War, um, I mean, in terms of the outcome, um, I think for for anyone who uh, you, you know knows anything about the Civil War, um, it led to uh, well another King Charles um, uh, having a. Uh, well, relatively extreme haircut, starting around the neck, kind of thing. Um, so, what, what what drove then uh, Parliament? Um, you know, how how did how did that come about? Well, again, I, I think um, I think it's probably often the case, but the revolution uh, doesn't start out with the aims that it ends up with often. Now, I call this a revolution because it's, you know, the English civil wars, two English civil wars, uh, but from the system that existed beforehand to the system that existed afterwards was quite clearly a revolution. Um, but the, the aims of it, it almost happened by accident, if you will. Nobody in Parliament, I think, um, set out with the aim to dethrone a monarch or execute a monarch. Um, I think the same, the very same people or the same sort of class of people who um, fought the civil war on Parliament's side were the same people who invited uh, King Charles II back to, to retake the throne at the, restora at the restoration. So it was, you know, it was not necessarily about becoming a republic. Well, it was almost certainly not about becoming a republic. Most of the pity. Interesting term in the use of revolution, because, of course, that means to come back full circle. And I suppose the conclusion is that the that the king comes back. Um, okay. <laughs> so the, um, the king's head is, you know, essentially fertilising uh, the birds and all of this now. Um, there were some very interesting groups that emerged in this in this period. I mean, uh, how true is it to say that um, it, well, uh, the Commonwealth uh, that was established uh, sort of after this regicide and what have you? How true is it to say that it was actually a republic? And can you can you talk to us about some of the the groups that sort of emerge in this period and what's going on with uh, religion? You know, um, you know just a, a broad picture. If you would, yeah. Well, to say to say that um, 
so so for to just touch on the enclosures again. So with the enclosures, uh, for example, um, they were they were the enclosures were happening probably from the Middle Ages in in small amounts right up until this period. And it's interesting that the enclosures, which you would think uh, with the king being pushed to one side and, and Parliament having supremacy, would have you know abated. Uh, they actually accelerated about tenfold after after the primacy of, of Parliament. And uh, from that time, there's actually um, a, a, a bit of verse, a bit of a song. It says, we lock up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, but leave the greater villain loose who steals the common from off the goose. The idea that, um, you know, you, you are probably quite literally going to go to the gallows, be hung, if you steal a, if you manage to steal a goose off, off somebody. Uh, yeah. We quite quite happily with the stroke of a pen steal everybody's livelihood that depends upon this land, um, and now that's mine, and I can make some money putting some sheep on it, and I can get rich on the wool trade, you know. Um, so the groups that sort of grew up around this time period, um, you've you've obviously got the the agitators, the levelers, the diggers, sort of political groups that grew out of this time period, but you've also got a a huge amount of sort of religious um, things fermenting there. Probably, um, probably things to do with uh, the printing press, the widely, wi more widely available distribution of uh, original source materials, um, things that, um, there's one up now, isn't there? Uh, things that, um, and also literacy, literacies growing as urbanisations growing, uh, literacy also begins to grow. I think previous to this, literacy would have been the the playground of either the rich or the uh, monastics, wouldn't it? Was it discouraged in uh, the working class or poor people, or was it just that it wasn't available? Um, yeah, it was. It was. It was cost. It was if you uh, if you could afford, you could um, you could be you could be able to send your children to, to to well probably male children probably to be to be honest uh, mm -hmm. to to get reading and writing. Um, it's it's all there was an amount of sort of um, the the. Parish would be able to educate certain um, certain on merit, um, but again, that this was about bringing them into their fold rather than educating them and right. them going back to the working class, if you will. Um, the, there's also quite a large amount at this time of what you would probably call owner operators, uh, people involved in things like the textile trade, especially around Lancashire, where I'm from, around Yorkshire, Derbyshire, uh, a lot of people who are um, in the rural villages, but they are maybe 50-50 on being agricultural workers and also supplementing their income by spinning, weaving, various um, sort of um, milling trades like that. And um, when it's it's sort of a cyclical cyclical industry where when there's a war on, it's good to be in textiles, and when the war finishes, there's a slump, and uh, these areas often end up in extreme poverty, and probably uh, often end up in revolts. To be honest, so you talked about the the various groups there, the agitators, levelers, and diggers, George. How did they come about their sort of political education? What was what was driving that sort of raising of awareness and what's going on in, in that? Um, well, it is it's an, it's an interesting thing because a lot of the the pamphleteering at the time, the, the the bit that was sort of up on screen, a lot of the pamphleteering at the time wasn't uh, calling for new rights. It wasn't calling for something that we've just thought of. It was calling back for rights that were um you know either born out of rights that had already existed and been taken away or in in certain instances like with the diggers for example 
they were calling back to things from the Bible. The, the idea that, for example, if if Adam and Eve uh, were the you know the uh, the originators of the human race, then why is it that some of Adam and Eve's uh, descendants are the ones that own all the property, and some of Adam and Eve's descendants are the ones who have to do all the work? Indeed. It's- there's some interesting parallels, isn't there? I mean, you talked about fighting for what we've just lost. And and certainly in the trade union movement, we see that with, with not looking at what we can achieve and gain, but looking at trying to fight for what we've lost in, in recent history. So that's, it's interesting. Again, on protests as well, we see the government in the UK and, and I'm sure there's parallels in the United States where you've got elected people pushing down and taking away rights that, that we've all enjoyed for, for most of our lives. Absolutely. And happen there, so it's interesting that there's well, some parallels well, with, there in the movement. <clears throat> well, with with the, with the diggers, um, you know, the, there was a, there's another quote for you, but it was that uh, God created the earth a common treasury for all mankind, and that's that basic idea that, well, if we're if we're all if we've all been you know if we we're all created by God, then why is it that some people lord it over some of the other people? Why is it that some people have to serve and some people have to rule? You know. Yeah, that whole, that whole bloodline thing was a was a real racket, you know, and continues to be, I'm afraid. But it's always, and I guess being raised in America, where we didn't, you know, we don't have a monarchy, um, it, it was always hard to understand. You know, it's like our motto, although this isn't doesn't always bear out. And believe me, I know all about all the horrible things, you know. Uh, that we have to deal with here, but it's always been kind of, you know, like the guy that, you know, pulls himself up by his own bootstraps and goes out and, you know, makes it big or makes it successfully uh, on a, on his own merit rather than, you know, who happened to give birth to him. So it's, you know, we've talked about this so much, James and, mm-hmm. and Sean uh, about how it, it that was really they it seems like such a racket you know and everybody just bought into it because that's the way it had been you know and so everyone kind of accepted it but it sounds like to me what you're saying is that you know there became a time you know when people started to really question that and say well wait a minute you know why should they have everything and you know the majority of people have nothing or very little is that sort of the way, it, was that sort of the mindset at the time where people started saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, how can this be just or, or fair? I think, that, I think those ideas were probably in existence. I think what, what allowed it to come through was the sort of breakdown of the, so the, the split in the, ruling class allowed there to be a chink in the armor for something to get through and for for example at the, at the putney debates where they were arguing about um, about suffrage about the idea that um, one of the ideas that they were talking there's quite a lot of radical ideas being discussed there but one of the ideas um they're saying that why are there um ordinary soldiers fighting in this um uh, english civil war to determine an outcome that they will have no um, no saying, i.e. they didn't get the vote before um, when there was a king. They're not going to get the vote afterwards. Uh, and the idea that... Um, and this was being argued against, to be fair, by Ayrton and Cromwell, the the, the so-called grandees uh, in the debates. It was being argued against. Um, the idea that... Um, I think the, the argument went that uh, nobody should... Nobody should have a vote who doesn't have a settled interest in the in the kingdom. Uh, the settled interest being property, basically, and the counter argument from Rainsborough being that people have um, bled, they've died, they've fought in these major battles which couldn't have been won without the ordinary soldiers. Is that not an interest? Is that is the toil on the land not an interest? Is the is the money that's made for people not an interest, despite the property ownership? What is it? Why is that the determining factor of what an interest in this country is? And to be fair, uh, going down the centuries, and I think the argument is still there at the moment, I mean, about um, 
who gets the franchise. I think there's talk at the moment in in, um, in the British Parliament about, around about whether EU citizens should get the vote in a in a future in a future vote. Well, again, they're they're good enough to work here. They're good enough to pay taxes here. They're good enough to contribute in that way. But oh no no no, it's it's, it's unthinkable that they would ever get the vote. So, George, uh, just for, for for those who are uh, totally, I mean, I think it's true to say in the US, UK and elsewhere, um, the notion of the Putney debate, for example, is uh, is, is unknown. What, what brought about the Putney debates? What what were they? Um, so the, the Putney debates, um, the, the army was, the army had camped outside London. Putney is now very much inside inside london but at the time it was a village outside of of, of london um the putney debates took place in i think it was saint mary's the parish church of saint mary's in putney um and uh, it took place over several days i think in late october and early november i think it was um there were there were hugely radical um ideas coming out the ability to um the ability to recall your member of parliament, something that still hasn't uh, been uh, achieved in in uh, in British Parliament. Uh, the I think they were calling for they were calling for the 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 period of office to be much shorter as well. They were calling for the, the suffrage to be. Um, I think they were probably still only calling for male suffrage, but they were calling for the suffrage to be massively expanded. Something that in uh, in in Britain wasn't achieved for, I'm not sure, at least 200, maybe 300 years, I'm not sure. Two, three centuries, yeah. I mean, the, it, so the, the debates were about one man, one vote and proposed uh, biennial parliament, um, which, you know, in the total absence of, uh, of all of this is, um, you know, of uh, parliaments uh, standing all the time um you know is you know is uh sort of un unheard of and it, it's curious again isn't it that these debates i mean it, who was at the debate i suppose we need to to sort of establish you know who who was there uh and is there a significance that these these debates that ripple through uh history the things that you know we we just tacitly accept today the idea that everyone can vote um you know, the fact that it was held in the church is just is interesting. So, who was at these debates? I mean, how how did they come about in that way? Um, um, well, you you had um, certain of the regiments were were called at the time leveller regiments. Some of these regiments um, were sort of thrown together. Um, you know, the, the 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 main part of the army the the went with the king and so parliament had to throw together an army um, at quite short notice and a lot of these regiments were sort of self-raised um lots coming out of london out of the apprentice apprentices who were already quite a radical um group of, of of people at the time and so a lot of these ideas that were already um bubbling away in sort of debates that would happen in the i don't know in the in the alehouse or in the uh you know the meeting places went to, went across into the army so as the army went around doing its the business of winning battles and marching across the country and everything it's uh probably much the same as armies ever have been it's all um hurry up and wait it's either 10 minutes of action and 24 hours of guarding latrines and you know, on picket duty and waiting around. So there's an awful lot of time for there to be debates around the campfire and in the tent and wherever. So I think those, those that melting pot of those ideas coming into contact with all sorts of people uh, had led to, the, led to these ideas becoming prominent. Uh, a lot of the officers of the leveller regiments were levellers, were... Um, eventually wheedled out of the army because so know, george just quick, sorry to uh, george who, who are the who are the levelers uh again just very conscious that not everyone will have have heard about them who who are the uh the levelers i mean uh as a group 
Um, yeah, so the the, lev- the levelers um, we're calling, as the as the name might um, might indicate, they were calling for things to be leveled out. Now you've got people like um, John Lilburn, prominent leveler, also a, I think he was a colonel. I'm not sure of his rank, maybe a major or a colonel, but he was um, notably um, in more than one battle. Uh, he was mentioned as being key to the battle being won that you know the line was wavering and Lilburn surged forwards and inspired his men and whatnot those were the people uh that were uh, that were that were officers for for a lot of these regiments and at Putney um you had a mix of or well they were elected from from the regiments so you had a mix of all ranks um all ranks below um, below commissioned officers were were able to elect one set of people, and then from the officers is where the grandees were elected, the people that um, were arguing against the increase of the franchise, against the uh, the the expanding of the rights of people. I would I would argue. Uh, fun, funnily enough, um, Cromwell. As a, a statue outside the Houses of Parliament, um, somebody who was probably uh, f- most famous for dismissing several parliaments, much the same as the King did, to be honest. So, w- w- I mean, we we've spoke about this. I mean, uh, Oliver Cromwell. Uh, uh, some people venerate him for for some reason and, and all of this, but he really. You know, he he became Lord Protector uh, of uh, this Commonwealth, uh, but in essence, he was a king. Why why did he take the title of Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of uh, England, Scotland, and Ireland? Well, nominally, I think he was arguing that uh, we've we've got rid of a king. Why would we want another one? But uh, as we've spoken about previously, I, I'm not so convinced because I think. Even though monarchs have a whole host of um, of rights, you know, near, nearly absolute rights, uh, they do have certain, you know, certain conventions, certain things that they have to adhere to, certain things like the existence of a parliament, for example, the idea that you can't go around taxing, uh, raising taxes without uh, a parliament being sitting. And I think that probably... I think uh, Cromwell was quite happy with the settlement how it was. He, he had all the he had all the plus sides of being a monarch and none of the negatives in his view, didn't he? It's interesting. Um, I mean, just a, a sort of a left ball uh, question. I mean, I've just said England, Scotland, and Ireland. Uh, there was uh, uh, colonies, or there were colonies uh, on the American shores during the. Civil War, as well as uh, some island holdings. I mean, Bermuda, for example, was settled, I think, in 1601 from the top of my head. Um, do we know the impact that this Civil War had on the American colonies? And do you think that maybe some of these ideas from John Lilburn, and I, I would just suggest that uh, um, anyone who wants to read about a character in history who ends up becoming a monarchist again, Sort of in the end, anyway, you know, it's a very interesting character. What impact do you think that the Civil War had on this new sort of, um, or the founding, I should say, of the American colonies than these United States? I think, I think there there has been a, a huge impact on it. I think maybe it could be transmitted through others. I think, you know, I don't think there would probably be writers like Thomas Paine if there hadn't have been writers like Lilburn, perhaps. Um, but I think um, sort of, I think, to be to be honest, I think Lilburn probably has made it across to the United States through things like, um, you know, the tr- uh, trial by trial by your peers and the, um, you'll, have to, you'll have to remind me which, uh, which amendment of the Constitution, but the right not to incriminate yourself. Is it, yeah. the, is it the fifth? The fifth. Yeah, the Fifth Amendment comes straight out of uh, straight out of Lilburn. Um, the other thing uh, that, uh, that that happened with Lilburn as well is that so Lilburn was um, 
consistently locked up. He was locked up uh, by King Charles uh, and, and interestingly, re always represented himself and uh, was often released because, um, you know, he, 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 had, he had legal arguments and precedent to call upon. But he also um, was locked up by Parliament and he was also uh, locked up by, by Cromwell, who in the end, Cromwell had him put on Jersey, um, the island of Jersey, just, just next to France. And interestingly, Jersey isn't part of England. It's 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 owned by you know the 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 crown at the time, but it isn't part of England. So I would I, again, I would argue that the idea of putting him on Jersey is a bit like uh, having the detention camps on Guantanamo Bay. The idea that it's it's over there. You don't have these English rights that you're quite eloquently uh, using to uh, get yourself out of jail. So just get off over there and languish in a dungeon. Very interesting. Sorry, Renee, over to you. No, I was just, uh, I was just, when you mentioned Jersey, I, you know, and I don't know a lot about Jersey Island, but it does seem like there's a, a sort of a, an idea of sort of like people just kind of running themselves over there. They're not, there's not a lot of oversight and it, it sounds like there's a lot of criminal behavior. Now I could be completely wrong and please correct me if I am. Uh, but from things that I've seen and read about, uh, it seems like that. So I guess that makes a lot of sense if they were sending over lawbreakers, uh, you know, to, to this Island, how, you know, it became sort of an Island of, of lawbreakers, but it's not just the lawbreakers. It's just anyone that was in opposition. Is that well, Fortunately, I mean, it's a, a, a ballywick. It's uh, controlled essentially by bailiffs, um, you know, in personal fealty to uh, the Monaco, I assume, in this period, to Cromwell. And I have to say, um, was a the first destination of fleeing uh, Huguenots from France, oh. um, who, you know, were smuggled over to, to Jersey in a, a chunk of... Uh, um, my family background, um, you know, this is true. They sort of go through Jersey over to then England for for some of these freedoms we keep on uh, hearing about uh, <laughs> religious uh, uh, freedoms, uh, perhaps, uh, and all of this. Right. Just just quickly, George, as well, just to go back. So we we see the levelers there, the the soldiers there who fought and bled for for this revolution. What stopped them from continuing once once they saw they weren't going to get complete suffrage and all that? What what stopped them from picking the spears up again or, or pikes and, and continuing and, and seeing the job through? Well, uh, they, they did. They did, to be honest. Um, so, um, well, probably not active, not actively um, prosecuting a revolution, but they, they effect, effectively mutinied or went on strike if you want if you're not if you're not going to listen to us we're not going to do anything um and eventually this um well i suppose at one stage it was touch and go it could have gone either way but eventually this led to the breaking up of the um the le certainly the hollowing out of the leveler officers will give them uh you know for want of a better phrase proper officers who will get them licked into shape and also um the a lot of the regiments were split up, were put with um, you know mixed into loyal regiments, and um, I think some of them were even fired upon. I think there was an artillery um, an artillery firing upon one of the regiments. Um, the other thing that happened as well is that um, sort of I don't know, perhaps veering into the conspiratorial uh, thing, but it's the second English Civil War kicked off. The the king, who was like safely under lock and key, uh, escaped and um, I think was off to Scotland to get the, was it the Covenanter army on board? Uh, and it was interesting how uh, the timing of this couldn't have been any better. Uh, Thomas Rainsborough, who was one of the, more eloquent and he was to be uh, uncharacteristically he was one of the officers of the uh, one of the high ranking officers but was arguing uh, on the on the side of the working people sort of at the at Putney 
um, he was, um, you know, whisked off to, I think it was probably this, it was Siege of Pontifract, I think it was. And he was just um, staying quite nearby. And he was uh, murdered, they think, in a, um, a, a plot to uh, kidnap him by royalists. So it's interesting how just at the right time, something came along to uh, split up the split up these agitators and uh, one of the key uh, spokespeople was uh, was killed could just be conspiratorial that though tend not to believe in uh, coincidences so uh, <laughs> you know, if, we, if we come back um well full circle if we take a revolution ourselves um how much did the, I mean, the Civil War uh, essentially, uh, the Civil Wars, plural, I should say, the Civil War sort of uh, conclude and eventually, you know, uh, Charlie Mark II comes back um, and all of this. But for the average uh, for the average person, you know, what, what we see is, um, you know, as you say, enclosures, the sort of strip system uh, of having you know just barely enough to survive is now enclosed by landowners you know um as in in essence um you know what benefit uh did the the average person have from you know either the conclusion to the civil war or you know events that followed afterwards um i would largely say very little. I mean, th there is the, there is the idea, like like I said at the beginning, of this being a revolution, where at the beginning uh, monarchs have absolute power, and afterwards uh, Parliament has primacy uh, to a large extent. But for the ordinary working people, I would argue that very little has changed. I mean, uh, before before the uh, the English Civil War. It was rich people who decided your de destiny, probably based on um, nobility and bloodline. And afterwards, it was rich people who decided your destiny. Probably, it's probably those same people, but also a, a larger mix of it being about money and land, and um, you know that the, the 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 amount of rich people who decided your destiny probably enlarged, but ultimately. You didn't get a say in what was going on. You didn't really get much of a, a change in those terms. The conditions of the enclosures, I would say, probably have had a big influence on, um, you know, the outcome of uh, later on the industrial revolution. People coming off the land and going into the cities, becoming uh, fodder for the dark satanic mills and whatnot. But um, that that isn't people controlling their own destiny. That's material conditions changing, I suppose. Well, I just want to uh, come in. I know Sean wants to come in. We're, we're running out of time. Uh, it's just flown by. Mm -hmm. But it, one, of, uh, one of the thoughts that I have with, uh, you know, these enclosures was um, you hear the aristocrats, uh, the landowners in history saying, actually, these farms are much more productive. And yet we know that there's a link between food prices and revolution it sort of um in a strange way these enclosures have uh well prompted eventually revolutions from the united states through france and uh, for those watching the show there is a graph uh that's up that was actually produced by someone called paul mason uh, for the BBC of all places uh, i know if you spell mistakes on it but uh what you can see is when food prices get to about 40%, uh, bread prices in this instance get to about 40% of income, there is a uh, revolt. My last question, George, before um, uh, I just pass over to, uh, to Sean, um, is uh, are the conditions that we saw with the Civil War uh, in England, Scotland, Ireland, um, the revolution that we saw in the United States, France, etc. Are we close to those conditions? Do you think? And uh, you know, could could Britain become a republic? Um, I think th there's been a lot of um, sort of lesson lessons learned from 
uh, from history from the ruling class. I think you know after this pe- after this period, you've got things like uh, fixing of fixing of um, corn prices and uh, poor laws, which would I, I suppose drive people into the workhouse, but also it stopped people becoming so poor that they were in this a pre-revolutionary situation. Could it happen now? Um, I suppose we're about to find out because I, I can't see very much being done to stop the... I think by this stage, we've had two years of high inflation in the UK, uh, probably close to... Probably exceeding probably 20% of increase. So, uh, you know, a fifth a fifth of price increases in the space of two years and not abating by the look of it. Um, I think, yeah, we're we're possibly about to find out. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's really interesting there as well. And and this follows on from the graph Jay's has put up. But do you think that we had our civil war a little bit too early because we see 1848 and, and most of Europe having drastic, drastic changes where we... We obviously didn't. We did a petition instead. Uh, do, do you think we did our sort of revolution and, and sort of changes a little bit too early? Um, possibly, but there's also the argument that without uh, without the ideas coming out of the English Civil War, perhaps they were the ones that fomented uh, other people to pick up those ideas. You know, certainly um, I, I would argue that the the United States, um, some of the radical ideas that were around at the uh, the time of the uh, you know the um, the, indep- the War of Independence, the Revolutionary War, were coming out of that very same uh, melting pot. I think ideas in um, Revolutionary France very similarly came out of the same melting pot. It's probably not right to. Claim ownership, claim ownership of them, but uh, I think those ideas have have come from somewhere, and they probably didn't just spring up out of uh, absolutist France, you know. So uh, we're out of uh, of time, and I won't pass on the message to um, or half of my countrymen and women in uh, France uh, that the English started the revolution although some people might uh, like it. So I suppose it, it, it's just uh, left to ask again, you know, so what's left? Uh, well, um, quite a lot to, to digest, pardon the, uh, the, the pun there, but um, it just reminds us that a lot of the rights that we see in history never really go away. They might be oppressed or subdued, but the idea is, find themselves in symbolism, they find themselves in hushed discussions, and this idea that rights can somehow be taken away with the stroke of the pen, the ideas remain, it's just back for us to reclaim them. And I would argue the trade union movement uh, is definitely key for that. But anyway, I've been James Martin. I'm Sean I'm Hulser. Hoping I'm Renee Barnett, butting in. Thanks, George, for being on. We'll have you back. Uh, Thanks for having me. See you soon. Bye, everyone.